lifted. Let our hands be lifted. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Thank you, Lord, for your sacrifice. Thank you, Lord, for the blood this morning. We give you praise and honor and glory. You alone are worthy of praise. You alone are worthy of honor in the mighty name of Jesus. Sister Diane, just lead us in a short chorus as we pick up the emblems. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. your name we glorify your name Lord we exalt you Lord we exalt you Lord we magnify you we glorify you we worship you Lord in the beauty of holiness we magnify and glorify your name Lord I pray that the entrance of your word will bring forth light and life into our hearts. I pray, Lord, that even now you will prepare our hearts to receive your word. Let your word be magnified in us, Lord. Let your word take premium uh, supremacy in our hearts and minds. And Father, we are careful to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. I want you to shake your neighbor's hand and tell them I'm glad to see you in the house of the Lord this morning. Hallelujah. It is a good thing to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. And before you take your seats, if you have your Bibles this morning, this morning we are in the book of Numbers. Numbers chapter 13. Could we stand this morning for the reading of the word? I don't know when last you went into the book of Numbers, but it's a very fantastic book. So I want to encourage you, if you have not gotten into the book of Numbers recently, go into the book of Numbers. It's a book of action. It's a book of demonstration of the power of Almighty God. This morning we are reading two portions of scripture. In fact, the text is the entire chapter 13. But in the interest of time, we, we're just going to read two excerpts. Verse 1 to 3. And then we will drop down to verse 26. 
Amen. I read you following your Bibles. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the children of Israel. Note the word of God. Eh? I am giving to the children of Israel. From every tribe of their fathers, you shall send a man, everyone a leader among them. So Moses sent them from the wilderness of Paran, according to the command of the Lord. All of them, men who were heads of the children of Israel. Verse 26. Now when they departed and came back to Moses and Aaron, and all the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh, they brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Then they told him and said, we went to the land where you sent us. So they're bringing back the report. It truly flows with milk and honey and this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. The Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the banks of the Jordan. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we, and they gave the children of Israel notice a bad report. Another version says an evil report of the land which they had spied out saying the land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw the giants the descendants of Enoch come from the giants and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight and so we were in their sight. May the Lord bless the reading of his word or hearing. Today we are speaking on the subject becoming giant killers. This is a prophetic word. I am releasing you are to become a giant killer. I thought I would get a bigger amen. 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 <laughs> amen. You may have your seats this morning. I thought I was going to get a bigger response. <laughs> and today, we have a lot of people pressing the panic button because of the prevalence of giants. There are many giants roaming our land. For some, their giant is crime and violence. For others, their giant is economic uncertainty, job losses. And still for others, their giant is sickness, disease, in some form, shape, or the other. I mean, you could name your giant. But I came here to tell you that no matter what form these giants manifest themselves, the result is the same. People are thrown into fear, torment, so much so that some people lose hope that any meaningful change will come out of their situation. And the question that arises to the born-again believer in response to these giants, can these giants be defeated? And if so, how? The average person does not know how to defeat their giant, and so the natural response is to complain. 
They complain about what the giant is doing. They complain of the giant riding the back. Complain, complain, complain. But should we as born again believers join the choir of complaints? Or should we have a different response? And through the experience of these Israelites that we just read about, we are going to discover that there is a right way and a wrong way to treat with our giants. You see, although the children of Israel were delivered from Egyptian bondage with a mighty hand, they were now on the cusp of entering the promised land. But soon enough, they discovered that claiming their inheritance wasn't automatic simply because God said so. In fact, to their surprise, they found out that the same land that God had promised them was laden with giants. But how could this be? After all, didn't God say he's given them the land? So how could it be when we're going to claim the land now, we find giants in the land? Is it that God was setting the people up? And that's the question that many people ask today. They say, why is this happening to me? How come God didn't answer my prayer yet? Why does God seem to be silent in the midst of this chaos, in the midst of the, these giants? And we could go on and on. But the real question we should be asking is not why, but how. How can we overcome? Because the presence of the giants in your promised land is not a setup for failure. It is a setup for your success. But you see, it comes down to what do you see when the giant comes knocking on your door. What do you see? In our text, God gave Moses instructions to send out 12 spies into the promised land and bring back a report. And when the spies returned, they confirmed, they said, yes, this land is indeed a land flowing with milk and honey. Look at the fruit. However, the majority of them gave an evil report. That's how the Lord called it, an evil report. They said that there were giants in the land and we were not able to take the land. This was in direct contradiction to the word of God. God said, I am giving you the land. But they know better than God. They said, there's giants there. We can't take it. You see, in order to claim the land, they had to become giant killers. God wanted them to come into their true identity. How did they describe themselves? They said, we are like grasshoppers. But God saw them as giant killers. But they weren't seeing that. That's why I said it all depends on what you see, and, this, and the same is true for us. In order for you to claim your inheritance, your favor, your blessings, whatever the Lord has declared over your life, you're going to have to become a giant killer. And this text shows us how. Firstly, to become a giant killer, you must first recognize and overcome your internal giant. Before you can defeat the external giants, you need to recognize that there are internal giants that you have to overcome. And the first thing I want you to notice in the text is why did God tell Moses to send 12 spies into the land? God had already given them the land. So what is the purpose of sending in the 12 spies? And from a human perspective, that seems counterproductive. 
But from the divine perspective, it was the right thing to do. Because God sees beyond what you and I could see. Man looks at outward appearances, but God, what does he do? He looks at the heart positions of men. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher. And the reason why God gave Moses this seemingly strange instruction is because God saw something that they could not see. What did God see? And to answer that question, I want to take you back to one year before this incident in the text. It's found in Exodus chapter 13, verse 17 and 18. One year before this, when they had just started out on their journey, God made a very telling statement about his people. He said, these people, Moses, they are a fickle and capricious bunch of people. And at the first sign of war, they are going to turn back. So what did God do? It says that he refused to lead them via the shorter route. Check it out. Exodus 13, 17 to 18. Exodus 13, 17 to 18. Instead, God decided to take the people on a longer route. Why? To avoid war. Because he said these people, they are unstable. They were so indoctrinated into the ways and the thinking of Egypt. And what does Egypt represent? Egypt is a type of the world. Egypt has a system that is diametrically opposed to the ways of God. And many times we exhibit the same behaviors as these capricious Israelites. We fail to exercise faith. And we often vacillate between two positions. We're not sure. That's why the Bible says a uh, double-minded man is what? Unstable in all his ways. And if that's not enough, we complain. We criticize. And we wonder why we are stuck on the proverbial treadmill. And the reason why these things keep happening is because we have not yet renewed our minds to the ways of God. And because we have not renewed our minds, we have challenges obeying God's word. We have challenges stepping out in faith. We have challenges taking God seriously. This was the fundamental flaw of the Israelites. Could you imagine? They had experienced tremendous miracles and deliverance. They saw God deliver them out of Egyptian bondage. They saw God decimated Egypt with ten plagues while they were protected, insulated. They saw God part the Red Sea. They saw God destroy the Egyptians in the Red Sea. They saw God through the Shekinah glory cloud, which was an air-conditioned system protecting them from the heat during the day and giving them cool, cooling during the night. They saw God rain manna from heaven. They saw God keeping their bodies in that wilderness and harsh conditions, keeping and preserving their shoes and their clothes, mighty Acts of deliverance and provision. They saw God brought water out of a rock. All of that they saw. And they were still doubtful. They were still unbelieving. In fact, according to Numbers, the very next chapter, Numbers 14, there was a group of them that was planning to turn back. Could you believe it? You've seen all of those signs before you confirming that this God who we are serving is a mighty God and yet you're going to turn back. And what this tells us is that even in the midst of supernatural protection, supernatural provision, we can still be fickle and prone 
a dope God. Many times, it seems like no matter what God does, we're still skeptical. And not even the supernatural hand of God is enough to change our wrong thinking. God had taken the children of Israel out of Egypt, but he did not succeed in taking Egypt out of their hearts. They experienced physical deliverance, but they were still in mental slavery. This is what happens when you become indoctrinated in the world system. The mindset of life in Egypt was so embedded in their minds that they were still thinking like the Egyptians, although they were transplanted into another location. So the key issue then in issues involving freedom and slavery is not the state of your external position, but it's the state of your internal disposition. You see, it's possible to be physically free, yet be in mental slavery. And it's for this reason God told Moses, send in the spies. The purpose of sending in the spies was not simply to reveal what was in the land. But more importantly, it was to reveal what was in their hearts. That's why the spies were sent in. God was using the occasion of sending in the spies to prove the people of Israel. To allow them to see what was in their hearts. You see, they had internal giants. Giants of fear, doubt, unbelief that threatened to undermine the external efforts. And so before you can conquer your external giants, you first need to overthrow the internal giants. Those giants that are hiding in your heart, you need to overthrow those giants. How do you overthrow those giants? You have to see them before you can be delivered from them. Sight brings insight. And insight brings deliverance. That's why it's important. That's why I said, what are you seeing when the giant comes knocking on your door? What are you seeing when you get the bad report from the doctor? What are you seeing when you lose your job? What are you seeing when your relationship crumbles? What do you see? You have to be delivered from those internal giants of fear, doubt, unbelief if you are to overcome those external giants that you may be facing. And that's why it may seem like God is giving you strange instructions. That's why it may seem like God is taking you on a longer route that you are on a detour. God is doing this not to frustrate, but to enlighten you. He wants you to see these internal giants that have embedded themselves deep in the recesses of your heart. Wants you to see them because once you can see them, you can be delivered from them. But secondly, to become a giant killer, you'll have to choose the divine perspective over the human perspective. There is a divine perspective to your situation. That's why I said God's ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. He does not see things the way we see them. He sees the end from the beginning. And one of the key issues in this entire story of God's dealings with the children of Israel is the contrast between the divine perspective and the human perspective. There is a difference between revelation knowledge and sense knowledge. There is a distinction between what we see in the word of God and what we see in the world around us. 
And throughout the narrative, there's a particular word that is repeated. It shows up in different forms. That word is the word sight. You will see it manifest as we saw, to see, to spy. Sight and blindness is of vital importance because what you see will determine your belief system. Your belief system in turn will determine your behavior. And finally, your behavior will determine your destiny. Sight then is crucial. Because sight is going to determine your destiny. And this is exactly what happens in the text. Everyone knew that this land was a land flowing with milk and honey. It was clear to see. And God had said, that this was a land flowing with milk and honey. The evidence supported that. But what they didn't see is that the promised land wasn't just a land laden with milk and honey, but the promised land was filled with giants. They didn't know that. And the imp there's an important lesson for us here is that sometimes you will discover, not sometimes, most times you'll discover that the promises of God, they come pre-packaged with opposition. Somebody needs to hear that this morning. The promises of God comes pre-packaged with opposition. Remember Abraham? God told Abraham, you will be a father of many nations. God told him that while his wife was barren. And before those promises were actualized in Abraham's life, he had to overcome opposition from within and from without. And so we are saying that the promises of God, they are not automatic. Before you can inherit the promises of God, there's a very good chance that you will be required to overcome some form of opposition. A giant. The pathway from promise to possession will require you to defeat some type of giant. You check it out. All of the, the men and women of God that we read about in the Bible, all of them had to overcome some kind of giant, some kind of obstacle, some form of opposition. It's because we live in a fallen world. It's because we are engaging a real devil. The Bible says you do not wrestle. Wrestle. You don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but what? It's principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. There's a real devil. He's going to come to wrestle. Wrestle suggests hand-to-hand -hand combat. He fights dirty. You will face opposition. But what God is revealing to us is that Although there is opposition to overcome, what he's actually revealing is that these promises, they are not for any and everyone. These promises are only for overcomers. That's what God was saying to them, you know. Because the promise comes with opposition. And so if you are to inherit the promise, you're going to have to overcome the opposition. So then what God is really saying, this promise is not for any Tom, Dick, and Harry. It is for overcomers. If you don't have the mentality of an overcomer, you're not going to get the promise. This is why many of them were destroyed. They were not overcomers. They were complainers. We miss in the leaks and the onions. You see you, Moses, who do you think you are? You feel you are the only man that's here from God? Complainers. And the Bible says God had to overthrow their bodies in the wilderness. They were complainers, not overcomers. 
Who are you this morning? Who are you? Are you an overcomer or a complainer? The only ones who inherit the promises of God are the overcomers. That's what Jesus said in the letters to the seven churches. He says, he that overcome, I will give the hidden manna. The promises are for overcomers. And this runs true and true. Every promise of God. And that's why, you see, it's God's desire for all men to be saved. Not so. It says, he, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But we know that's not going to happen. In fact, more will be lost than saved. Why? Because salvation is for those who exercise faith in God. God has made salvation available to all. But to inherit salvation, you have to be an overcomer. The Bible says, he who endures to the, what? To the end. You have to be an overcomer. You have to endure to the end. Endure suggests struggle. Endure suggests that there's going to be some battles that you have to fight. You're going to have to endure to the end. And that's the ones that will be saved. That's why you need to be careful of, you know, these, these messages that overemphasize the grace of God. Almost as though you don't have to do anything. Uh-huh. The Bible says, by grace, through faith. God's responsibility is to provide grace. Your responsibility is to provide faith. What is the victory that overcomes the world? Your faith. You have to exercise faith. You're not going to stumble into heaven. You're not going to just wake up and magically appear there. No, you have faith. That's why the Bible says, all those who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecutions, trials, testing, because the trial of your faith work at patience. The promise is for the overcomer. The one who is prepared to exercise faith. The one who is prepared to be a giant killer. You have to be a giant killer. Becoming a giant killer is not an option, you know. Because if you don't become a giant killer, you will be killed by the giant. So becoming a giant killer is absolutely important. And we talk about this word overcomer. There are some overcomers in the text. Out of the 12 spies, two of them were overcomers. Only two, Joshua and Caleb. The other ten were an abysmal bunch of cowards. That's how God saw them, as cowards. You say, why? Why are you so harsh? You know why, you know why God saw them as cowards? And God actually destroyed them. Eh? If you read in the, the subsequent chapters, those ten spies that brought an evil report, they were killed. You know why? Because they failed to respond in faith. All they saw is what their senses told them. They did not focus on what God's word said. God said, I am giving you the land. They ignored what God said. They did not consider what God said. They said, we went into the land. We see the sons of Enoch there. And hear what they say here. We were like grasshoppers in their sight. Who tell them that? God says, this land is yours. They saw the giants, but they failed to see the truth of God's word. You see, although it was a fact that there were giants in the land, the truth was they were able to defeat the giants. That was the truth. You know why that was the truth? Because God was with them. So you may be facing giants. It's a fact. Giant in your health. 
Giant in your finances. Giant all around. That's the fact. But the truth is, you can overcome those giants. Because God is with you. I said, God is with you. Amen. The Bible says, greater is he that is in you than he that is what? In the world. So it may be a fact that sickness is in your body. But the truth says, by his stripes you were healed. It's a fact that crime and violence is pervading our land. But the truth is, no plague shall come nigh your dwelling. The Bible says he will put a protective shield around you to protect you and keep you. That is the truth. The truth is, is that we, his people who are called by his name, if we will humble ourselves and pray, the Bible says God will hear from heaven and heal our land. Why is the land not being healed? It's because we are not doing what we're supposed to do. Collectively, the church, we're not doing what we're supposed to do. Because God's word is always true. And so, we will only experience the truth when we focus on truth over facts. Truth must become a giant in your mind over the facts. Because what you focus on becomes your reality. If you focus on the facts, that will be your reality. If you focus on the truth, that will be your reality. Proverbs 23, 7 puts it like this. It says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. In other words, we become what we think. If you keep thinking about the negatives, if you keep focusing on the giant, then what is going to happen? That's the fruit you're going to, that's the fruit you're going to experience. You're going to experience defeat. That's what these, the, the ten spies did. All they could talk about it's the giant, how big the giant is, and how, you know, the land devouring the people, and you eat like grasshoppers. That's all they could talk about. You notice how Caleb spoke? You saw the difference? He didn't talk about them giant at all. He says, let us go at once. We can take them. God is with us. What are you focusing on? What are you talking about? If every time you open your mouth... Boy, I like I born to see trouble. Boy, I don't know when last I get a full salary. Boy, I know I, all you're doing is describing the problem, talking about the problem. Stop talking about the problem. Stop giving life to the problem. Stop giving fuel to the problem. Talk about your God. Talk about what God says. He says, uh, uh, I shall supply all your needs according to my riches and glory. Talk about the fact that you are more than a conqueror. Talk about the fact that God always leads us in a triumphant procession. Talk about those things. What you focus on becomes a reality. Stop focusing on the negative. That's what the enemy wants you to do. The Bible says death and life is in the power of the tongue. Stop using your tongue to speak death into your life. God never called us to be commentators. You are not called to be a commentator. When he, to when he, when he, when he brought Ezekiel in the valley of the dry bones, he said, son of man, what do you see? He said, I see a valley of the dry bones. Did God tell him to be a commentator? He said, son of man, prophesy to those dry bones. Speak life into those dry bones. You are called to be a creator. Speak life into your situation. Stop speaking death. Stop empowering the devil in your life. Stop speaking death. Start speaking life. Stop speaking evil report over your life. You know, the doctor give you a report. And all you can talk about, well, the doctor say all this. The doctor say all this. But what does God say? 
What does God say? Whose report do you believe? Stop elevating the evil report. Doctor can say what they want. What does God say about the situation? Start to say that. Start talking that. The doctor said this, but God says, I am healed. I am healed in the mighty name of Jesus. Start speaking that. Speak words of life. You are a giant killer. This was the era of the ten spies. All they could talk about was the facts. All they could talk about was describing what they saw in the natural. All they could talk about is what their senses told them. But the two spies who were overcomers had a different kind of speech. They had a different kind of language. You know why? It's because they saw differently. They saw from the divine perspective. They were not talking about what they saw with their human eyes. They were talking what they saw with their spiritual eyes. They were talking the divine perspective. That's why I ask you, what do you see? And because of what they saw, it affected their speech. It affected their belief system. It affected their behavior. They, they, they appeared like crazy people. I am sure when Caleb rose up and said, let us go at once, they must say, well, who is this madman, boy? Where he come from? And that's how they may describe you. Who is that mad woman, boy? Where she <laughs> who she feels she is? But you are a child of God. Yeah. I don't care if they call me madman. When God says, well done, good and faithful servant, that's all I want to hear. Yeah. Well done, good and faithful servant. Yeah. And look at the contrast. The ten spies, their lives were cut short. But the two spies who were overcomers, God gave them long life. And they were the only two. Could you believe it? Out of that million plus people there, they were the only two who inherited the promised land. Amen. You could go and check that out in Joshua chapter 11 and Joshua chapter 15. They didn't just inherit the promised land, but they went on to annihilate those giants. This is exactly what they said. And it's all because of what they saw or what they chose to focus on. Their faith filtered out all of the things they saw in the natural. And so they focus only on the word of God. That's how you have to use your faith. Use your faith to filter out all the noise in the natural environment. All the raw, raw, raw and the rah, rah, rah from the giant. Use your faith to filter that out. Focus on the word of God. That's how you become a giant killer. And as I conclude this morning, I want to contrast the behavior of the ten cowards with the two overcomers. The first thing we see, to overcome the visible giants that you may be experiencing in your life, giants like crime, sickness, poverty, and so on, you have to overcome invisible giants of fear, doubt, unbelief, mistrust, disobedience. Those are the things you need to overcome. The internal giants that are embedded in your heart, you have to overcome those first. Secondly, you need to recognize the presence of a greater giant in the midst of your giants. That giant is the word of God. The word of God trumps everything else. See, the word of God is truth. And truth, truth will always trump the facts. So the question that you have to ask yourself, am I prepared to look beyond the facts and embrace the truth? When sickness is rattling in your body like Brother Adley shared here, when sickness is coming upon you, are you prepared to look beyond the facts?
to the truth. The truth is, you are healed. I said, the truth is, you are healed. Hmm. You see, truth will trump the facts. And truth will cause your giant to become like midgets. You know what I'm telling you? Truth will cause your giant to become like a midget. You can stomp on that midget. <laughs> In the text, when they were called on to respond, all the ten cowards could do is describe the facts. You notice that's all they were doing? Describing the facts. And by describing the facts, what they do? You're fueling your fears. You're making doubt and fear a giant in your mind. Anytime you start describing facts, you are causing fear and doubt and unbelief to become giants in your mind and your heart. But what did the overcomers do? They didn't describe the facts, you know. Because we are not called to describe the facts. We are more than conquerors. The overcomer says, come, let us go at once. Let us go and take the land. The overcomers were bold. They were, they were talking about taking action. That's what overcomers do. The overcomers don't talk about things, you know. Overcomers take action. They are action-oriented people. Joshua chapter 11. Joshua and Caleb killed their giants because they fully obeyed the word of God. Your success in killing your giant is determined by your obedience to the word of God. The final thing I want to say this morning there, there was a statement that was made about Joshua and Caleb in chapter 14, verse 24 of Numbers. It said that they had a different spirit. This spirit infected and affected every aspect of their lives. It was responsible for their faith, their courage, their determination. And this really is a prophetic picture of who we are in Christ. Because we are filled with the Holy Spirit. We have a different spirit to what the people have in the world. And so we ought to be like Joshua and Caleb to our generation. Courageous, bold, prepared to take action. Prepared to engage the enemy. You must not be afraid of the enemy. You must not be afraid of your giants. Ten cowards, they were ready to run. Notice that? But overcomers don't run from the giant, you know. They run to the giant. That's what David did. The Bible says David ran towards Goliath. Don't run from Goliath. Don't run, don't run. Run to Goliath. Run to your giant. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You have a different spirit in you. You have that same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. It dwells in you. It shall quicken your mortal bodies. It's a different spirit. And so I ask you this morning, what are you seeing when the giant comes calling upon you? When the giant comes knocking in your home? Knocking on the door in your workplace. When the giant comes in the church, what do you see? <laughs> when you look at yourself, what do you see? Do you see a grasshopper? What do you see? Or do you see a giant? I'm saying it's time to start seeing yourself as giant killers. Because that is who you are. Let's bow our heads to prayer. Let's put our hands together for the Lord this morning. We give you praise, Lord. We give you honor. We give you glory. Could we stand in the presence of the Lord? Hallelujah. Father, we give you praise. Lord, this is a word to shift us. Shift. 
Lord says, the Lord says there's a shift taking place right now. There's a shift in taking place. From fear to faith. From grasshopper to giant killer. There's a shift taking place. There's a courage. There's a boldness rising on the inside of us. Mighty God. Lord, let your spirit reign in us. Let your spirit rest upon us. Mighty God, open our spiritual eyes, Lord, to see who we are in Christ. That we are not grasshoppers. That we are not undergoers. But we are overcomers. Lord, you have given us weapons that are mighty in God to the pulling down of strongholds. Mighty God, I pray that you will shift our mindset, shift our mentality. Allow us to see ourselves, Lord, as you see us, as more than conquerors, as victorious, mighty God. So, Father, we thank you for what you have accomplished here today in the mighty name of Jesus. And you may be in the service this morning, you're facing some giants. There's some giants that are confronting you this morning. You want to step out in faith. You want to arise. You want to engage. We're going to pray with you, but we're not just going to pray with you. We want you to rise up. Let that holy indignation rise up in you. You can confront your giants head on. So if you want ministry this morning, you have some giants that, that you are contending with, come to the front. We're going to pray with you and for you this morning. We give God the praise. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to I wanna sing that song, Here is in Heaven. The atmosphere is changing now For the Spirit of the Lord is here The evidence is all around That the Spirit of the Lord is here Overflowing this place, fill our hearts with your love, your love surrounds us. You're the reason, you're the reason we came to encounter your love, your love surrounds Atmosphere is changing now. For the Spirit of the Lord is here. The evidence is all around that the Spirit of Overflowing this place, fill our hearts with your love, with uplifted hands. Your love surrounds us. You're the reason we came. You're the reason we came to encounter your love. Your love surrounds us. Spirit of the Lord is here. Hallelujah. The evidence is all around. Hallelujah. That the Spirit of the Lord is here. Overflow. Overflow in this place. Fill our hearts with your 
ahead, go ahead. Every giant, every giant must fall right now in the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. Every giant has to fall in the mighty name of Jesus. Giant of sickness, giant of cancer, giant of disease. I cut you down in the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. Mighty God, let your presence fall fresh upon your daughter right now. Let faith arise in her heart, Lord. Let there be a, a boldness. Let there be courage, Lord, resting and abiding upon her in the mighty name of Jesus, in the mighty name of Jesus, every giant has to fall, every giant is being cut down right now, in the mighty name of Jesus, in the mighty name of Jesus, every giant, giant of in the finances, I pull you down, I cast you down right now, in the name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus, every giant has to fall. Every giant we cast down, we pull down in the mighty name of Jesus. Every habit, every, every destructive habit, we cut down right now in the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus, let your presence, Lord, rest upon him. In the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. Every giant. Every giant has to come down. Every giant must fall. In the mighty name of Jesus. Let your presence. Let your presence rest upon her Lord. Rest upon her in the mighty name of Jesus. Precious Holy Ghost. More of your presence. Let the weight of your glory. Rest upon her. In Jesus name. In Jesus name. In Jesus' name. Every giant has to fall in the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. By brother God says, you are going to be a flame of fire. Let the fire of the Holy Ghost rest upon him in the mighty name of Jesus. Yes, Lord. More of your presence. More of your glory. More of your glory, Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. Cleanse. Purify. Flush out every dross. Every impurity. In the mighty name of Jesus. And the weight of your glory. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus. A flame of fire. A flame of fire. That's what God says. You are going to be a flame of fire in the mighty name of Jesus. The fire of the Holy Ghost will be evident in your life, in your ministry, in your voice. There's a fire that is rising from the inside even now. Holy Ghost, fire, cleanse, purify, mighty God. Prepare this vessel, mighty God, to be used as a flame of fire for your honor and your glory in the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus, fall fresh on us. We need your presence. Hallelujah. Your kingdom come. Your will be done here as in Hallelujah.
So we're going to wait on you for the tithe and the seed offering as we continue with that song. Could we get the words? Sister Jane, could we get the words? Hallelujah. Seed offering will go after the tithe. Come on, let's sing that song. Sing it like you mean it. Spirit of the Lord is Hallelujah. The evidence is all around. The Spirit of the Lord is here. Overflow in this place. Fill our hearts with your